Today, what we're going to talk about is how it is that we classify stars based on their temperature. All stars give off all colors of light. And when you mix all those colors together, our eye perceives that as white, which explains why, for the most part, all stars appear whitish in the sky. I say white-ish because we also know that the temperature of a star determines how much of each color it gives off. And it does not give off all the colors equally. It gives off some colors more than others based on its temperature. Stars that have about the temperature of the sun give off more of the middle wavelengths of light, sort of the yellowish wavelengths of light, and less of the others. And so when those um, wavelengths mix together, we see those stars as sort of a yellowish white. Hotter stars give off more shorter wavelengths of light, more towards the bluer end of the spectrum. And therefore they give off more of the bluer light than the other colors, and so they are going to appear bluish white to our eyes. And cooler stars give off more of the longer wavelengths of light, and therefore will appear to our eyes to be more reddish white. Now, the other thing we need to understand is that there is more than just the color of a star. Although we can see the overall color of a star, if you were to actually take the light from a star and spread it out through something called a spectroscope or spectrograph, and actually look at the specific wavelengths of light that a star is giving off, you would notice that there are missing wavelengths in the star's spectrum. And those missing wavelengths would show up as black gaps, black um, lines, if you will, in the spectrum, where there is literally a missing wavelength. In fact, there's more than one missing wavelength. And this is what we call an absorption spectrum. So as an example, the inner part of the sun gives off a nice, smooth, continuous rainbow spectrum. But the outer layers of the sun absorb some of those wavelengths. And so by the time they reach our eye, we see all these missing wavelengths, these dark lines. This is another way to view it here. Here is light given off from the sun in the visible portion of the spectrum. And you can see it is not a smooth, continuous curve. There are these gaps in the spectrum where some of the light has been absorbed by the composition of that star. Well, each of those gaps corresponds to specific elements or substances that are in that star. And so when we look at a star spectrum, we can see these lines and we can actually identify what elements in the star are absorbing those wavelengths. So for example, these red missing lines over here are characteristic of hydrogen. Only hydrogen absorbs this specific wavelength. And there are other wavelengths over here that are also corresponding to hydrogen, making up an overall pattern or fingerprint or barcode that is unique to hydrogen. Down here towards the bottom, you'll see some dark lines here. These are characteristic of sodium. And so we can see that there are some amounts of sodium in this particular star. Well, it turns out that depending on the temperature of the star, even if the star has the exact same composition, temperature determines how strong different lines of different substances will be. And so if I look at a star's spectrum, since I know all stars are composed primarily of hydrogen, and I see that it's got very strong hydrogen lines, then that tells me that it's probably on the hotter end of the spectrum of stars. But you'll notice that as the star gets cooler, those hydrogen lines get weaker and other lines get stronger. And so by looking at the spectral lines of that star, I can tell, wow, it's got weak hydrogen lines, but strong sodium lines. That tells me that the temperature of the star is probably a bit cooler. And in fact, I can not only say that it's probably a bit cooler, I can actually specify the temperature of that star based on the spectral lines that I can see. So as an example, higher temperature stars tend to show more prominent helium lines, whereas medium temperature stars tend to show more prominent hydrogen lines. As the star gets cooler, cooler stars show more prominent calcium lines, and the coolest of stars show very prominent titanium oxide lines. Well, Astronomers going back 100 to 150 years or so, including a very famous one named Annie Jump Cannon, identified that these spectral patterns can be used to sort of classify stars by the type of spectra that they give off. And that spectrum is in turn related to the temperature of a star. These came to be known as spectral classes or spectral types. And so the spectral type of a star is classified by their temperature using letters to represent a range of temperatures that a star in that particular uh, class or type will have. So as an example, the hottest stars in the universe are what we call O and B class stars. 
the hottest stars are the O-class stars. So the surface temperature is greater than about 30,000 Kelvin, which is about five or six times the surface temperature of the sun. And B-class stars are a little bit cooler between about 10,000 and 30,000 Kelvin, but still quite hot. And these appear, not surprisingly, bluish white to the eye. As you go into cooler stars, you get into A, F, and G type stars, each of which has a corresponding temperature range. And so as we finally move towards the coolest stars, we get into the more orange and red stars. And these are the K and M type stars that have cooler surface temperatures. Now you can clearly see that these temperature um, classes are not alphabetical. And there's a whole history behind that we won't go into, but you're free to look it up on your own. And so oftentimes people make mnemonic devices to help remember the order of these letters. So a classic one is, oh, be a fine girl or guy, depending on your preference, kiss me. O-B-A-F-G-K-M. I've also heard, oh, big and furry gorilla kill me, which is a little morbid, but perhaps sticks in your mind a little bit better. I'll leave it to you to come up with your own mnemonic, but essentially O and B and A class stars are among the hottest. F and G class stars are sort of medium temperature stars, and K and M class stars are the cooler stars that appear more orangish red in the sky. So to wrap things up, we can basically say that the coolest stars that we're going to be talking about in this class are sort of your M class stars. These are stars that have relatively cool surface temperatures. Um, our medium temperature stars, not unlike the sun, are more of your F and G class stars. And your high temperature stars are gonna be more of your O, B, and A class stars. Now, the last thing I'll mention is this. Um, the sun is a G type yellow dwarf star. That is its official title as a star. What it basically means is, it is that a, it is a relatively small medium temperature star compared to the other types of stars, but it will not always be a G type yellow dwarf star. In the distant future, some 5 billion years from now, the sun is going to begin to swell in size as it swells, its surface is actually going to cool and it will evolve into an M class, because it's got a cool surface, red giant because it's a very large surface area. That we'll talk about a little bit later. So the sun will not always be a G-type yellow dwarf star. Lastly, those cool red dwarf stars are by far the most common type of star. M-class main sequence stars, red dwarf stars, make up approximately 75 out of every 100 stars in our galaxy. By contrast, O, B, and A-class stars, those hot blue stars, those make up only about five out of every hundred stars. So the sun is not the most abundant, but it's also not the least abundant in the galaxy in terms of its type, okay? So that's spectral class or spectral type, letters that represent temperature ranges that allow us to classify stars by their temperature.